Most gracious and heavenly Father, we come this morning boldly before your throne of grace and mercy, giving thanks and praises. We come saying thank you, Father, for waking us up this morning, Father God, for you didn't have to, yet you chose and saw fit for us to be here. Father, we thank you for the activity of our limbs, for being closed in our right minds. Lord, we thank you for your word and every blessing that you bestowed upon us. Though we don't deserve them, Father God, you love us and continue to bless us. And so for that, we give thanks, Father. Now I come, Lord God, asking, as your humble servant, asking that you would just use me, that I may be a vessel to speak to your people, to give to them the word that you have given to me, Father God, that though they hear my voice, see my face, Father God, that it'll be your words that they hear. I pray that I would decrease as the Holy Spirit will increase, Lord God, and that I just be and make myself available for your use. This and all things we pray in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Well, good morning to all. I'm giving honor and glory to God, the Most High, He who sits high and looks low, the Creator of all that ever was and all that ever will be. Um, honor to Pastor Daniels in his absence, Minister Jermaine Bowens. And um, it actually feels good to be here. It's been a while since I've been before you, and I'm thankful for this opportunity. Um, we have Thanksgiving season, so, you know, we're in the holiday season. And uh, you know, a lot of times this is a time of the year where, you know, people come together and families come together and celebrate. And I'm definitely looking for, you know, and grateful for, you know, being able to get my grub on during this season, put on a few pounds that I probably don't need. And, um, you know, a lot of times during this time of the year, we often get a chance to see people that we haven't had to see. You know, we haven't had the chance to, to hang out with. And especially considering this year, you know, uh, and I feel like it's nothing like coming together for a good meal. Amen. Like, but uh, this is probably a time that most of us can probably use, you know, to just kind of relax and unwind. Um, considering all that we've gone through this year. Um, I say that this year, 2020, uh, has most definitely been a year for the books. Um, you know, we've had to deal with the antics of our current president, Donald Trump, and even president-elect, you know, Biden, um, with the things they had going on regarding this campaign and this election. And, uh, you know, obviously we're going to have a new president in office, but, you know, this election was, you know, the last two that I've, I've witnessed have actually been very different seeing, you know, the way that, uh, things in what's supposed to be one of the most uh, prolific offices in the world, you know, the way things have been run, it kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, concerns me um, as far as where we are as a people and as a country. Um, you know, this year we actually had the way, you know, usually, you know, the the few elections that I've been old enough and alive, you know, that I've actually paid attention to, um, to where we've actually had presidential elections. This is the first I can recall where it's been you know, days later, and we're finally realizing, you know, who's going to actually win the race or the election, supposedly. And then even dealing with after the fact of they've made an announcement of who the president is going to be, we still got, you know, all of these allegations and accusations that oh, there's cheating and all these other things going on. But it just really, um, <clears throat> it, it gave me a lot of concern as far as, as I said before, this nation and this country. But one thing I will say is that it doesn't matter who's in that White House because we know who's in the big house. Amen. And so that being said, despite what goes on in the office, despite who's elected, we know who still runs the show. And aside from that, you know, this year we've also had to make a whole lot of adjustments. You know, uh, we were definitely, I'd say, thrown for a loop given this whole COVID crisis. I mean, this has definitely been something that um, I don't believe anybody foresaw coming into 2020. Um, you know, there have been certain things, predictions and things of this nature about things happening. But, I mean, you know, this this isn't the first virus we've had to deal with. You know, we had to deal with the global pandemic or, of, of the HIV virus, you know what I'm saying? But it didn't attack the world on this type of scale because of the way it was, you know what I'm saying, that it's transmitted. We've had to deal with, you know, in, in, in more recent years, you know, as I can recall, you know, the, the Zika virus, of course, the Ebola outbreak a few years ago, um, what is it? Was it, I think swine flu, the bird flu. You know, we've had to deal with a few viruses, but I believe that this coronavirus took the world by storm. You know, we've had to deal with all of the the, the conspiracy theories on one how it was created. You know, um, 
the way it was spread as, as it did, it was went rampant like a wildfire. Um, we even, you know, have had to look at just the whole life change. You know, we, we went from living life regularly to lockdown. That's something that, you know, we, we haven't experienced in more recent years. Um, social distancing. So now that's made it even harder for us to be united as a people because now we're forced, you know what I'm saying, to be separated. But it's not necessarily a bad thing because sometimes God needs to get you alone and in your own space so that he can work with and deal with you on a personal level. So I'm hoping that during some of these times that some of us are taking the time to actually tighten up and strengthen our relationship, not only with ourselves and with our immediate family, but with the most high. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking on even on a wider scale outside of just locally and personally, just how this this year has been affected with this coronavirus because of you know, the, the economy being crippled, you know, there have been small businesses that have been shut down and even large businesses that have gone out of business. And so we hear a bunch of people hollering and fussing and everybody wants some type of vaccine or some type of cure. Everybody's trying to run the man and trusting the man, trying to figure out what this man or that man or that woman is going to do. But if my Bible served me correctly, I recall in Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter, about the 14th verse, it speaks very directly and clear. And God is speaking to his people saying that if my people who are called by my name. Now, the first thing I want to say is that some people are not going to hear that because, well, everybody isn't called by his name. We're just going to say the truth. You know, it is what it is. But he says that if, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that's the first thing. You know, we all puffed up in pride. I mean, just look at who we have representing this country. A man full of arrogance, a man full of pride, a man who was overly confident and was very cocky, you know. God is saying, humble yourself. And then he's saying, pray. They've taken prayer out of everything. You know what I mean? Now, if I pray at the bus stop, I got to be careful because I might offend this other person who doesn't believe the same thing I believe. But I'm not going to tell you not to pray to who you pray to. I'm just going to do my job as a minister of the word of God to, to, to try to tell you what it is that I know to be right. But it says, and then seek my face well we ain't seeking his face because we looking at all these other people we too busy being connected on the internet and things of that nature that we can't seek his face but it says then if we turn from the wicked ways i'm just gonna go ahead and say it uh i mean the world has gotten a lot wiser but a whole lot more wicked and it seems like bad is the new good and good is the new bad these days you know, and, and that's just not how things ought to be. But it says, then will God hear from heaven and forgive our sin, which means that we have to ask for forgiveness. So first we have to acknowledge that we're even sinners. We have to ask for his forgiveness after we began to pray. And then he'll heal the land. But ain't nobody taking those steps. We all expect a man to come along and save us. But the Bible has been very clear that man will fail you every time. Amen. And again, this is not a political debate. That's not what I'm here for. But, you know, just these are just some of the pressing issues and things that are going on in this world today. But one thing I do want to say, one thing I do have to say is that I'm thankful that God's grace is sufficient in any and everything. So if you could please uh, turn me to Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter, reading verses 7 through 10. And I'm going to be reading out of the King James. But um, as I did my sermon the, the, the word that the lord gave me uh i i use the uh english standard version a lot <clears throat> and it reads as follows starting at verse seven and lest i should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of satan to buffet me lest i should be exalted above measure for this thing i besought the lord thrice that it might depart from me and he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, as we read this passage, um, we understand, obviously, that the Apostle Paul you know, who was also known as the apostle to the Gentiles, he's who penned this passage. He wrote this letter uh, to the church of Corinth. And um, this is his, what we have on record as his second letter, but there was actually other letters that were lost. Um, I believe there are two of them that are lost now. 
So this is actually the third or fourth letter that was written by Paul. And this particular church had a whole lot of issues. You know, the church of Corinth was in a, in a, in a nice location. Um, it was in a port area and there was a lot of trade and things going on. But there was a whole lot of stuff that was going on in this church that in his first letter that we have recorded that we can read in the, in the book prior to this one, which is the first Corinthians. Um, there was a lot of stuff that he had to go in and clean up and straighten out. There were certain perversions that were going on among church members. And there were things that were really absurd even to those who were outsiders, even among the Gentiles found that there were certain things that, that were offensive and, and what you would consider taboo. And so at this point in his ministry, Paul is now because there were people obviously questioning, well, on what authority do you come telling us this, that, and the third? And on who gave you the power and, you know, who are you? And so we find that in this letter, he's actually doing a lot of uh, defending his ministry and his positions. And so uh, we see as we read in this letter that it's talking about a thorn in his flesh and what's going on. And we don't understand what this storm was. We don't understand what was going on with Paul. But to kind of understand the reasoning behind it, I have to take you a little further or well, a little earlier in this passage. And so I'm going to go up a little further so that you can kind of understand exactly what's going on. So we see Paul uh, earlier in this uh, passage where he's talking about certain incidents that went on where he was given certain visions. As a matter of fact, he said, I knew a man. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Only God knoweth. Now, it's ironic that Paul is speaking in third person in that point. And what he's doing in my perspective and what I've gathered is that he was being humble in his approach because he doesn't want to sound proudful and puffed up. So he's saying, I knew a man at one point. Yeah, he's referencing, I am that man, but he doesn't want to seem like I'm bigger than you or I'm bigger than anybody else. So he's going to speak in third person, though he's referencing himself. But he talks about saying that this man was caught up to the third heaven. Now, those that understand, the third heaven is what is known as where the throne of God is. You know what I'm saying? This is past the sky that we see daily. This is past outer space. This is above the moon, the stars, the sun. This is actually the third heaven where the Most High Himself lives. And it says that he was caught up into this place. And again, he says he doesn't know whether it was his physical body or whether it was spiritual that God knows. But he was caught up into what he refers to as paradise and it says that he heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter he said and of such one will I glory yet of myself I will not glory but in my infirmities so what he's saying is that I can talk about these things I was given these revelations and I wouldn't be lying in the things that I'm telling you but because it's not about me and because I don't want to get big headed, I'm not going to speak on these things. Because once he already said, it's unlawful for man to murmur. And so what he refers to this type of boasting and, and glorying as, as he says, is foolish. And he very clearly says, I shall not be foolish. So Paul is basically saying this ain't about me. But what we find here is that in verse 7, he says he received a thorn in his flesh. Now, he speaks about these visions, these revelations that he's received that, that would pretty much uh, trump any other man that we've known in that time. And yet he still is being humble. But he's speaking on these things to make it clear and make it known that, look, I was been, I've been divinely touched by God. The Most High has divinely placed his hand upon me. So anything that I'm doing is out of the jurisdiction and the authority that has been vested in me by Yahweh himself. So we're not going to sit here and act like, oh, I'm just doing this because I want to know this was placed upon me by God. That is where I got the authority. And it reminds me of a young fellow who was 12 years old in the temple that was chastising the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees by the name of Jesus. Amen. But we see, as I said, that he found that he had this thorn in his flesh. Now, it doesn't tell us what the thorn was. You know, he never stated what it was, but. I would gather that it caused him great discomfort, that it was something that, you know, was, was probably debilitating because it says that he asked God three times to remove it. So I would imagine that this is something that affected his ability to work, that obviously if it affected his ability to work, then it would most likely affect his ministry in some shape, form or fashion. So some have suggested it could have been, you know, some type of uh, disease. It could have been something like malaria or something like that. Um, 
possibly something, you know, some type of issue with his eyes because we recall, you know, we, we found on his road to Damascus on his conversion that there were scales placed over his eyes. So that could have been some, you know, some residue from that incident. Um, it could have been some type of physical issue because as we know with Paul, you know, he's been through various physical altercations. You know, he suffered great physical violence for Christ's sake along his journeys. So we really don't know what it was. It could have even been some type of mental issue or some type of mental, uh, I guess you would say, strain because of how strong of a spiritual battle that he had to fight to where, you know, he was dealing with these who were practicing other types of uh, what they would consider religions and dealing with idolatry and things like that. So we really aren't sure what the thorn was, but we know that it was a thorn. But it says that he asked the Lord to remove it and that this thorn was what they refer to in this word as a messenger of Satan. And it was sent to harass him. And as I said, he bothered him so much that he asked God to remove it. Now, I want to point out something that, that as I was studying this and looking over this, it kind of stood out to me. It says that Paul tells us that God gave him the thorn. But the messenger of Satan is who delivered it. Now, that kind of blew my mind when I realized that. Because when you take down what's going on, we read the scripture and it says, unless I be exalted above measure. So what he's saying is that so that I don't get the big head, God gave me a thorn in my flesh. But it says that the messenger of Satan is who delivered it. So there are times where God will give us a delivering type of pain that will help us. But the, ev the enemy will deliver that trying to hurt us but it reminds me of what was said that i want to say is genesis 50 and 20 what you meant for evil god used for good and so we find that day to day in our lives there are so many things that happen to us that you know we end up better off because god has allowed things that's a prime example of what went on with joseph as i said in genesis the 50th chapter you know his brothers took something they they, they tried evil on him and and all what ended up happening it ended up working out for Joseph's good. So remind me of what's said in Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And you got to be called according to his purpose, not your own. Amen. But as I go forward, you know, it, it, it just tripped me out that I realized that God used something that hurt us or will hinder us to protect us. And he'll use something that will cause us to solely depend on him to keep us from ourselves. Because, you know, pride is the same thing that got Lucifer cast down. And that I is the middle letter in pride. That I is the middle letter in the word or the name Lucifer. That I is the middle letter in the word sin. So I seem to have a problem with myself. We end up with these eye conditions and end up on our own way. And so what God did to keep Paul from dealing with that is he gave him something that would hinder him so that you got to depend on me. You have to make sure that I'm the one who's getting you through this. It can't be you because you're not able to do it on your own. But as we go forward, we see that whatever this thorn was, Paul was going through it. And it was going through it to a point where, as I said, he asked God to remove it from him in verse 8. It says he pleaded with him three times that it should leave, and God refused. Now, have you ever asked God for something and he didn't do it? Have you ever had to deal with something in your life and ask God, hey, can you do this for me? Hey, God, can you do that for me? And God didn't do it. You wanted this house, but... Because you got that spending habit. God knows you're not going to be able to pay your mortgage. You're going to end up getting evicted. So I'm going to put you in this house. It's not the house you wanted. But I know with the way you live that you'll be able to maintain your mortgage or your rent in this house. You wanted that Mercedes Benz. But well, God knows you won't, don't keep up with your maintenance and your oil changes like you should. So yeah, you didn't get that new 2020 Benz or that 2020 BMW. But he gave you that 2019 Chevy. But the maintenance is going to be less. So again, you'll still be able to keep up with your payments and, you know, it's not as expensive that, that, that Chevy, you know, while it may depreciate more, it's not going to cost you as much. So you may appreciate more. Amen. 
And so we find in instances that God may not give us what we want, but he'll give us what we need. And so right now we're upset, but what we don't realize is that God is benefiting us and saving us and helping us out in the long run. But because we so short sighted, we don't see the bigger picture. We so stuck in what we want, what we feel, what we think, what we like, you know. And so we realize that God actually is, is more on our team than we think. It's just because we can't get what we want, so we throw tantrums. And I'm talking about us adults. I ain't, this ain't about the kids. I'm talking about us grown folks. Because I've caught myself, I found myself guilty of it at times. But I'm thankful for every lesson that he's given me. Amen. And so we find that God is refusing Paul's request. And so Paul is probably going through it. I would imagine it to be some tough times, you know. But there is a scripture that really talks about going through tough times. It says in James, the first chapter, verses 2 through 4. It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, steadfastness is patience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a different word. I'm going to say patience instead of steadfastness. But it says, and let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So that probably to most of us doesn't even make sense wait a minute you telling me to be glad that i'm going through good bad times like that doesn't even make sense but what we got to understand is that when we're going through bad times god, god is doing a good thing but the issue is that while the circumstances around us feel bad god is doing something good in us but we don't see it that way because it's hard to see the picture when you're inside the frame so while god don't always take you right out of the circumstance what he will do is he'll give you something to get you through the circumstance. So in Paul's case, you know, he ended up with a better character. You know, he was more humble, gave him stronger humility. You know what I'm saying? Because of these trials. And because he had a physical ailment and debility, he was able to empathize better with the people around him. Because now if you look around, you know, who am I to be all high and mighty and tell you what you ought to do? But I'm sitting here and I got a peg leg or, you know what I'm saying? I got my foot ain't working. I got gout in my legs. I got cancer. I got COPD or emphysema. I can't breathe. I can't X, Y, and Z. But because Paul also had some type of physical ailment, he's not able to empathize. Because now what happens is that you don't have the excuse that you was trying to lean on. Because God's grace is sufficient. Amen. And so oftentimes, you know, things jump up in our lives and we want what we want. And we kind of end up thinking of God as like a genie. You know, we end up wanting to be Aladdin and we want to rub the lamp and he ends up the genie. And so if I want this, you're supposed to grant me what I want just because I say so. But no, it doesn't work like that. See, we forget that it isn't about us. It's about what he wants for us. It's about what he desires of us. But because we're so self-centered, we want what we want. We expect what we expect, but we lose sight of what it is, the ultimate goal. We're supposed to be out here trying to win and save souls. And so we end up thinking and looking and moving and doing what we ought not do because we're trying to get and obtain what we want. But the scripture says in Matthew 6 and 33, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. So if you stop looking for the things and start seeking for the God, the things will come along because God going to make sure you got what you need. But as I said earlier, you know, we get wrapped up in dealing with ourselves and with what we want. And we end up forgetting about the seeking God part because we're so busy seeking or whatever else it is that we're seeking. Whether it's self-gratification, self-pleasure, whatever it is that's going to make us feel good. That's what we're more focused with. And that's not how it ought to be. So as we go forward, we see that God did not remove the thorn, but he did answer Paul's prayer. Now it says in verse 9 that the Most High said to the Apostle, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Now I wouldn't know, but I'm pretty sure that Paul being who he was with all his righteousness and, you know, I'm pretty sure that he probably was expecting, okay, I'm a faithful man. I'm a man of faith. I know that God, I've seen God do this. God has given me the ability to, to, to heal others, and he's given me the ability to perform wonders. I'm pretty sure he's going to heal me. Have you ever been in that boat where you didn't ask God to do something, and God responded to you, but he didn't respond the way you wanted? So what you end up doing is saying, well, he didn't answer my prayer. No, he answered your prayer. Sometimes the answer is no. 
But we don't want to hear no. We always think that, again, that, oh, you're a genie in a bottle. I'm in control. No, no, no. That's not how it goes. So what ends up happening is that we don't receive or accept the answer that God gives us because it isn't the answer that we want. But again, it's thy will be done, not mine. Now imagine if Jesus would have been over there in, that, in the Garden of Gethsemane and would have said, yeah, I'm not going to go through with this because it's about me. I, I, I don't want to deal with this because it's going to hurt, you know, because it's going to be painful. It's going to be uncomfortable. I don't, I don't want to be stretched out and hung on that cross. I don't want to go through this because I didn't do the things that they did. They should have to go. Where would we all be? But because it wasn't about him, but about him who sent him, we are where we are today. So we have to stop being so focused on ourselves and start compl and stop complaining and start being more grateful and appreciative of what we have. Because just because he don't answer the way you want, don't mean he didn't answer. Because he may not always give you what you want, but he always gives you what you need. And so just me being me, I would imagine that that definitely wasn't the answer Paul was expecting. He was probably like, really? Everything you're going to do, so you're going to do your grace sufficient, huh? Like... You know, and, and I mean, he might have felt stumped. I would have been like, what does that even mean? Like, what, what? come on, God, what are you saying? Are you playing? I would imagine God has a sense of humor. Because if I'm sitting here hurting, crying, you know, I, I got to ailment myself. I'm getting a little older. I got a back problem. I probably need to drop some of these pounds. But if I ask God, God, can you stop making my back hurt? And he tell me my grace is sufficient. I'm going to be like, what? Well, thank you for your grace, but what about this pain? Then he might tell me, you know, we'll go get a back brace or something, you know. But... At the end of the day, I know that he's going to get me through and get me to where I need to go. So, sometimes God allows us to go through these things and puts us in these positions. And it's not the most favorable position in our sight, in our mind, in our view. But it's exactly what God wants us to be. Because in that moment, in that circumstance, in that situation, he can work through us. And so, we see that <clears throat> it tells us in 1 Thessalonians... 518 in everything give thanks why because this is the will of god in christ concerning you what does that mean well paul that thorn in your flesh this is my will for you in this moment so we see paul actually embody this because as he went on toward the end of this ninth verse he actually states he proclaims and says therefore i will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So instantly God responded, Paul reacted. See, we get wrapped up right there. Once God responds, we react, but it's not in a positive manner. See, God responded to Paul and Paul reacted in a godly manner because it wasn't about Paul. It was about what God wanted Paul to do. We get the response from God and then we throwing fits. I ain't going to church. I'm not reading my Bible. I don't want to hear that. I'm not praying. I'm upset with you right now, God. But then let everything go haywire. And God, can you please? Oh, no. Now, now we mad if God tells us I'm not listening to that. I don't want to hear that. The last time you asked me something, I answered, and you threw a fit. So don't ask me anything else. Then we'll think he's wrong. But no, nah, he wouldn't be because that's something that we do to our children or to other people regularly. You talking to me crazy? I don't want to talk to you no more. If God had the same mindset we have, where would we be, y'all? But thank God his grace is sufficient. But then Paul goes on and states in the 10th verse. He says that for the sake of Christ, then am I, listen to this word, y'all, content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. He said he was content. Now, he didn't describe nothing that was good. Now the scripture says in all things give thanks and, and Paul wrote in another letter that he wrote He says that I've learned to be content when I have and when I have not Paul just described five different negatives And yet he said he was content Now I'm, I'm going to be honest I ain't Paul So I'm not content with the weaknesses. I don't be content with insults. I don't be content with the hardships, the persecutors, and I show ain't content when it's calamities. But I've learned to accept that which I cannot change and be thankful for that which I can and thankful that God has granted me what I need to make it through each and every circumstance and situation. So we see that Paul understood what God desired of him. He understood what the Most High was saying. And even though at times he didn't feel good, 
we didn't find him complaining. As a matter of fact, we find him and hear him giving thanks just as we should. Seeing Paul ain't saying thank you for my bad times. He's not saying thank you that I'm hurting. He's not saying thank you that ain't, it ain't going the way I want. But what he's being thankful for is the fact that yeah, I'm in this situation. But I'm thankful God that your grace is sufficient for me in this situation. I'm thankful God that your grace is sufficient for me in my circumstance. I'm thankful God that you are with me in my situation. And thankful that you are with me in my circumstance. So I understand now why it's okay to be thankful in all things. Because in all things, the Lord has already promised us. Lo, I am with you always. Even until the end of the world. So we need to be thankful that he's with us. As opposed to complaining about what he got us going through. Amen. But <clears throat> as I was stating, you know, so he ain't saying be thankful because God didn't change the circumstances. What Paul is saying is be thankful that God is changing you in the circumstances. That God is with you in the situation. Yeah, you got laid off from your job. But be thankful that God is going to provide a means for you to make what you need to make until you get another job. You know, but we don't have that mindset. Soon as we lose a job, man, even five me. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Oh Lord, I ain't gonna be able to do X, Y, and Z. Nah. What we need to do is, okay, God, that may not be what you had for me. So, what is your will? What is the next step that I should take? Because Proverbs tells us that acknowledge Him in all things. Three and six, you know, acknowledge Him in all things. But we don't do that. What we do is we get mad, we get upset, and we acknowledge what we don't like. And then we react and respond and move out of what we don't like, out of what we didn't have, out of what we want to get, but what we couldn't get or what we couldn't do or where we couldn't go. It's constant complaining and fussing, never thanking him for the grace that he's given us to even make it to where we are. Amen. So God ain't going to always give us a way out the situation. But just as he did with the lady with the issue of blood, his grace is sufficient that we will reach to the hem of his garment. If y'all don't call the lady with the issue of blood, the lady had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now in Jewish tradition and custom, and back in those times, she had an issue of blood, she was menstruating for 12 years. During those times, a woman was thought unclean, was found to be unclean, so that means she had to be isolated, quarantined, if you would say. 2020, y'all. So this woman had to be isolated and separated from her family from her friends, from all of her loved ones, which means she didn't have a husband, she didn't have kids, and as you read the story, it tells us that she had spent all her money on all the doctors, physicians, clinicians, and everything she could, and nobody could fix her. No one could heal her. Now, everybody looks at the miracle in the story and says, oh, she heard wind of Jesus, and she made it, and thought, if I could just touch the hem of her garment, I'd be healed. And that's a great thing. God is a healer and he's still in the healing business. But the thing that we got to understand is that God had already given her grace and the grace was sufficient enough for her to live for 12 years, which means she lived past 11 years, which should have killed her in the first year. But because his grace was so sufficient, she had just enough to get to her breaking point where she fell into him and his garden and instantly she was healed. So his grace, just as it was then, sufficient for her. His grace is sufficient for you to make it over that mountain that's in front of you. You know, the same mountain that he said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could look at that mountain and tell it to be moved. That mountain will move after you do. Because, see, the mountain ain't going to just get up and go in the ocean. You're going to have to take some steps to go over that mountain. That mountain will move after you because, well, faith without works is dead. So faith doesn't do anything if you don't take a step. Amen. But just as that grace was sufficient for her, his grace is sufficient for you to make it through the valley. That's after the mountain that you just crossed. That grace is sufficient for you to get through all the things that you're going through in your life. You have to trust in him. You have to walk by faith and not by sight. And know that he will make a way. And above all, be thankful that his grace is sufficient in all things. God bless.